गुड इवनिंग ऑल वेलकम टू द ए आई जे वेबिनार सीरीज सीरीज दिस इज द नाइन्थ वेबिनार वी आर डूइंग एट अवर हॉस्पिटल ऑन बी हाफ ऑफ ए आई जी हॉस्पिटल एंड ऑन बी हाफ ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनएससीज एफ पेरी ऑपरेट मेडिसिन क्रिटिकल केयर वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस वेबिनार ऑन डिफिकल्ट एयरवे वी आर फॉर्चुनेट टू हैव टू रिनोन्ड इंटरनेशनल फैकल्टी डॉक्टर अपेक्ष पटवा एंड डॉक्टर शीला नैन मेत्रा हु हैव ग्रेज दिस वेबिनार टूडे Uh, so to begin with uh, we'll be uh, discussing the first topic on anatomically challenging airway followed by physiological challenges in uh, difficult airway management and then a uh, few interesting case uh, reports that we have done in this hospital so to begin with uh, i invite dr apeksh patwa who is the head of uh, who is the director of uh, uh, vadodara institute of neurosciences at uh, vadodara and is also executive member of ida the all india difficult airway association and he is a course director of uh, aida difficult and advanced airway management fellowship uh, program at uh, godraj uh, vadodara he has several publications to his credit and he has uh, been a lead author and co-author of several guidelines on difficult airway management over to you dr apex he'll be discussing on anatomically challenging uh, difficult airway thank you thank you dr sunil pandya for uh, uh, your kind introduction and it's always a pleasure to work with you and be with you and thank you team aig and uh, dr sunil pandya for giving me this platform so i'm going to talk on anatomically challenging error so when, once i issued the invitation to deliver this talk i, I got confused okay, what to speak about in the anatomically challenging error because is i have made a little number of literature so i have not get the this particular terminology anatomically challenging error so in my mind is a confusing terminology so i have tried to find out the types of anatomical challenging error in my way and i have defined also this anatomically challenging error in my way and according to this is a clinical situation where you get a difficulty in securing the airway or difficulty in maintaining the integrity of upper airway or difficulty in maintaining the oxygenation because of altered upper airway anatomy or pathological lesion in the upper airway so this type of airway we can call a anatomically challenging airway so which types should be included in this anatomically challenging airway there are number of terminology like difficult airway this all all of us are aware of what is difficult error in psychological difficult error because of psychological pressure psychological impact it hampers the success or process of error management difficult we can call it as a psychological difficult error i'm not going to talk about the physiological error but because of physiological derangement during the error management it creates the hypotension hypoxemia and intubation related complications but Just call the physiological defect error, but uh, it will be well described by in uh, Dr. Shaila Maitra in the next lecture. And another is compromise error. Among these four category, we we can call difficult error or compromise error as anatomically challenging error. So now, what is a difficult error? It's a clinical situation as defined by ASA 13 uh, guideline. is a clinical situation in which a conventionally trained anesthesiologist experience difficulty with face mask ventilation or difficulty with intubation or both again is not well defined because there is not a proper global perspectives of experience conventionally trained experience anesthesiologists so there's the limitations and this definition is not purely focusing on oxygenation there's the another limitation however there are two type of uh, difficult airway one anticipated <coughs> difficult airway another is <coughs> unanticipated difficult airway so anticipation difficult airway we can predict difficult airway by change in or there is alteration in airway anatomy or by presence of airway pathology in upper airway pathology in upper airway like this receding mandible or malum patti grade 2 or restricted neck extension no mouth opening these are altered anatomy and lead to challenge during the airway management so we can call this as a 
anatomically challenging difficult airway same way there is a space occupying lesion in upper airway we can call this as also anatomically challenging airway another airway that is labeled as compromised airway where there is a functional or anatomical luminal narrowing of the upper airway like in case of huge thyroid because of trichomalacia or vocal cord palsy there is a functional or anatomical luminal narrowing in in case obese patient with osa there is a pharyngeal collapse there is a functional narrowing of the airway or space occupying lesion in the upper airway or infraglottic region or trachea again makes the airway management challenging and we can label these airways also as anatomical challenging airway. so over and above this type of airway extubation is more challenging but what we should call as a anatomically challenging extubation so whenever there is a inability or difficulty in maintaining airway integrity or oxygenation after extubation because of surgery or because of altered anatomy or because of anesthesia that we should label as anatomically challenging extubation and this airway also we should label as anatomically challenging airway so before going into detail of the airway management during induction i'll discuss first the challenging anatomically challenging extubation so in 2016 aida guideline has identified the predictors for anatomically challenging extubation in a two group first patient with 4d and second patient with 3s 4d means if patient were having difficult is having difficult mass ventilation difficult intubation or reintubation and difficulty due to pre existing disease and 3s that includes surgical cause of airway compromise at the time of recovery recovery suspected airway edema and suspected airway collapse this type of airways at the time of recovery we should consider as anatomically or difficult extubation or anatomically challenging extubation so we we'll start with the three axes first axis is surgical cause of airway compromise in most many of the upper airway surgery the complication which happens which develop during surgery makes the extubation complicated or anatomically challenging like in thyroid surgery because of trichomalacia vocal cord palsy and higher chances of uh, neck hematoma makes the extubation challenging other fixed plating of the cervical spine again it restricted uh, access to the airway because of you can't give the neck extension hematoma in carotid surgery or altered anatomy because of surgical process in head and neck surgery makes the extubation challenging so over and above this other as is same as surgical cause of airway compromise other causes because of surgical requirement there is restricted access to the airway after surgery like in case of interdental wiring or cervical fixed cervical implant with the fixed traction position or flap with the fixed traction position you can't access the airway so this type of airways or extubation we should consider as a anatomically challenging extubations and many a times because of anesthesia or surgery makes the certain changes in the anatomy like airway edema and airway collapse and this type of extubations also we should consider as anatomically challenging extubations like multiple with the multiple attempts of intubation leads to airway trauma or airway edema improper selection of the size of the tube or over inflation of the cuff leads to high airway high cuff pressure and leads to mucosal pressure uh, necrosis and airway edema multiple insert, attempts of insertion with the uh, rice tube also can lead to airway edema and complicate the extubation process it makes the extubation anatomically challenging and over and above this extreme hello position with fluid overload for a prolonged period of time leads to airway edema and makes the extubation anatomically challenging so coming to the other part of four is that is difficult mass ventilation difficult intubation or difficult intubations always consider airway surgery 
hidden neck surgeries, and when surgical duration is more than three hours. These are potential risk factor for reintubation. Now, we'll take another example. Uh, extubations can be difficult because of pre-existing disease like obesity and OSA. But there are higher chances of apneic spell in patients with OSA makes the extubation difficult or anatomically challenging. And there will be a airway edema in pre-eclampsia and eclampsia makes the extubation challenging. And excessive secretions with the COPD also makes the extubation challenging. So these type of extubations we should consider as an anatomically challenging airway. So how to manage extubation, anatomically challenging extubation? For that you need to learn an art of extubation. First, you need to predict. Already we have discussed the prediction. Then you need to plan. Then you need to make preparations. And then you have to perform the procedure. And then do proper optimal post extubation care. And extubation is an elective procedure. If you feel this patient is not able to extubate, do not extubate. So prediction already we have discussed. How to, how to do planning for extubating the anatomically challenging patient? For that, you need to ask the number of questions to yourself. First question, you should ask, can I do it? And answer to these questions depends on your surgical skill, your uh, skill of extubation, your expertise, and your confidence. Then another question you should ask to yourself. Once you get the answer of these questions, you should ask another question. Should I do it? And the answer to these questions is depend on the patient physiological condition and OT environment. But to get the proper answer, then ask third question to yourself. When should I do it? Is it the right time to do the extubation on table? Or should I wait for a 20 minute? Or should I wait for a 30 minute? Or should I wait for a 6 hours? Or should I wait for a 24 hours? So once you get answer of all these questions, then it's time to extubate the patient. Then you need to decide how to do it. And all the anatomical challenging extubation should be done over the airway exchange catheter. And airway exchange catheter is a hollow catheter of more than double the size of endotical tube size, roughly 84 centimeter. It's a hollow catheter. You can insufflate the oxygen to the hollow channel up to one to two liter per minute. So this is one of the video of extubation over the EC. Uh, this is the post uh, commando surgery and extubating after 24 hours with the AC with proper lubrication and proper, proper uh, so, uh, spraying of solution over the AC with the local. I'm inserting the catheter inside the endotical tube up to 20 desirable length and over the AC extubating a patient and insufflating the one to two liter of oxygen through the AEC, airway exchange catheter. And you can keep this AET up to two to four hours, but reported cases are there up to 24 hours. And when patient is fully conscious, there are less chances of reintubation, when there are less chances of collapse, then you can easily remove. And if required to reintubate, you can use the AEC as a conduit to endotical tube. Another technique is hybrid technique of extubation this can be used when you want to minimize the hemodynamic fluctuation in anatomically challenging extubations. So in such case, insert the AC over through the tube, remove the tube over the AC. And over the AC, this should be done in paralyzed patient. And over the AC, insert the supraglottic airway. I am inserting the IGL over the AC. Then continue with the ventilator. Ventilation change from pre, uh, pressure control mode to pressure support mode. Reverse the patient, and if patient is con when patient become conscious, remove the supraglottic airway device. Keep the AC in C2, and when patient is fully away, and when there is less chances of airway collapse or there are less chances of uh, reintubation, you can easily remove the AC after a couple of hours. The patient is, patient can tolerate this very well, patient is phonety, showing the tongue. So this is another way of extubating anatomically challenging extubation. In certain 
cases, there are, there are likely chances of infraglotic collapse, like trichomalacia. In such type of cases, we should extubate this patient under vision over the fiber optic scope. And if there is a tracheal collapse, you can immediately re-intubate. That's the advantage of using fiber optic scope for extubation. So, extubation over the AEC. So, you have predicted, you have make a plan. Now, it's time to preparation. So, when you are preparing the anatomically challenging extubation, always sensitize your OT staff. Ask them not to go out during the recovery time, during the activations. Give proper job listing to them. Like one person should hold the suction catheter, one person should be ready with the cryotherosite, one person should be ready with the oxygen delivery device. Prepare for reintubation. Always keep airway cart ready along with the cryotherosite and other airway gadget uh, airway devices. And before extubation, always optimize patient physiological conditions and ensure recruitment before extubating a patient. So now it's time to perform the extubations. So when you are planning to perform the extubation, always discuss the plan of extubation and its consequences with the surgical team and then perform the extubation. And in 2016, All India Difficult Area Association has given the ex excellent systematic approach towards the uh, anatomically challenging extubations. Uh, they have given the approach for a normal extubation, routine extubation for the normal airway also. So it's having three limbs. First limb is for normal airway. Second limb is for the patient who are having any one of the four Ds. And third limb is for patient for who are having uh, one of the three Ss. So if you are extubating a patient with anatomically challenging extubation with the four Ds or three S, then always extubate the patient over AEC. All three, all four Ds and three, three S extubation should be done over the AEC. But the approach strategy is different in all scenarios. Let's start with the four D. If your patient is having any 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 of these four Ds, then keep the difficult airway cart ready. When patient is fully awake and all, properly commanding, then extubate the patient over AEC after ensuring the recruitment and throughout the procedure of extubation, supplement the oxygen. And after removal of tube, consider giving CPAP or high flow nasal oxygenation. So if you are encountered the patient with the, any of three S, the first step you need to decide, okay, the, is this patient, is able, are we able to extubate this patient? or should we directly go for the tracheostomy? And if it's not possible to extubate, then directly go for the extubate, uh, for the tracheostomy. Then you are, if you are deciding about the extubating this patient, then with that airway cart ready, do consider doing cuff leak test on ventilator. And if leak is present, then it suggests there is a no infraglottic collapse or edema. Then you can extubate the patient under uh, monitor care area over the AEC or over the fiber optic scope after answering the recruitment. But if leak is absent or equivocal, then delay the extubation. Don't extubate at that time. Assess, assess the patient frequently and consider giving measure to reduce airway edema. So when you feel at this time, this patient is able, I, I am able to extubate this patient, then extubate the patient under optimal depth of anesthesia, under inhalation anesthesia in OT or the AC or FOB. And in any case, either in three years, if after extubation, if airway obstruction persists, reintubate the patient and plan for take your story. And always document and counsel the relative. Further monitor for the, for the complications and treat the airway edema if suspected. See, high flow nasal oxygen is a newer device. It's having promising role in managing the anatomically challenging airways, anatomically challenging extubation also. 
Why? Because it, with the high flow of 70 liter per minute humidified heated gas, it decreases the work of breathing. It matches the high FiO2 to maintain and ensure the oxygenations. It generates three to seven centimeter of H2O seepage with the closed mouth. It increases the FRC. It generates the same centimeter of H2O. It reasonably maintains the airway integrity also. And it augments the CO2 removal by dish phase flushing. So it helps in CO2 removal also. This is the one of the video where showing the flushing of the dish phase with the different flow. This is with the normal control one. This is with the 15 liter per minute flow. This is the 30 liter per minute nozzle flow. This is the 45 liter per minute. So dish phase flushing is more as flow is higher. So it's having promising role because it maintains the airway integrity, it maintains the oxygenation, it uh, wash out the CO2 and it generates the CPAP. So it's helpful and it improves the non-hypoxic apnea time when given in a paralyzed patient. So it's having promising role in difficult extubation also and managing a difficult airway also. So now coming to the anatomically challenging airway during induction. So we have already discussed okay, this type of airway, it's an anticipated difficult airway because of altered anatomy or pathological lesion in the upper airway or compromised airway. So how to manage an anatomically challenging airway during the induction? It's a complex phenomena like walking on a row between the two mountains. So, you need to have a proper experience, experience and skill when you're traveling, walking on the road. Same way, when you are managing an anatomically challenging airway, you should have enough experience and you should be skillful to manage such type of cases. Another, you need to sort out the technical issues. Like if rope is uh, not tight, it's very difficult to walk on the loose rope. Same way, when you are managing an anatomically challenging airway, Check the, all the equipment what we are going to use properly. Sort out all the technical issue and then proceed. Keep yourself cool. A human factor all and time pressure is also having an impact on the success when you are managing an anatomical challenging area. Keep yourself cool down. Ask pro staff to cooperate you. Pro train, train them properly and then manage the, this anatomical challenging area. Same time, environment is also having impact because of wind direction also plays the role in the balancing act. Same way when you are managing the anatomically challenging airway, over atmosphere and training of staff and cooperation from the staff and support to help also plays the role for the success of this challenging airway. So, how to proceed? How to manage the anatomically challenging error? First, you need to define the technique. Which technique are you going to use? First, decide whether you are trying for tracheostomy or not. If yes, then it's fine. If you know, then you need to decide should I induce, uh, should I make the intubation or error maintain, I mean, awake state or anesthetized phase or in an anesthetized patient. So, when you are making decision to go with the anesthesia, then again you need to make a decision. Should I preserve the respiration or should I give relaxant in this difficult or anatomically challenging airway? So if you are going for a away, then you need to make a decision. Should I use video laryngoscopy or should I use fiber optic? That depends on your skill and patient condition. So once you decide, then next question you should ask yourself, I am experienced experience enough or skillful to use the device for this case or not? If not, Call for help and always make a habit of having assistant or two person for extubation when you are managing the anatomically challenging, challenging intubation as well as extubation. So once once you clear with your experience, uh, answer to your experience and skill, then check whether there is availability of difficult area card. Keep the backup plan ready. Keep the uh, cricothyroid set ready and uh, ask desire help from the staff, make a proper coordination and teamwork will give you a proper success when you manage the anatomically challenging airway. 
So in short, you need to define the technique, you need to define the device, you need to uh, check your skill and expertise, and you need to prepare or you need to check the availability of your resources. Then and then you are able to make the success in an anatomically challenging area. So let's start with the different cases for this discussion. So we have to manage this case. How to go ahead? First, I will decide, should I go for tracheostomy or not? I will not. So now, next question, should I keep this patient awake or should I give anesthesia? So my answer, I will keep this patient awake. The next question, should I use video laryngoscopy or should I do fiber optic? So because of acute curvature of the, uh, this is fixed flexion deformity during an oncology, fixed curvature, acute curvature of oropharynx, there are likely chances video laryngoscopy may not work in spite of having normal mouth opening. So I'll go for a awake fiber optic. So this is how you should ask yourself and proceed with the difficult error management. This is another case where it's a post-mandibular tummy cases for redo surgery with normal mouth opening. It's a young fellow. So I asked first patient to me, should, what should I do? Take your stomach? No, my answer is no. Then I asked another question to myself, should I do in a way or not? So I got the answer, you should do it in a way. Then third patients, should I use video laryngoscope or fiber optic? Then I have decided, yes, mouth opening is good, curve, anatomical curvature, oropharyngeal laryngeal curvature is normal. I can go ahead with the video laryngoscopy and I have managed this case with awake video laryngoscopy with nasotical intubation. Look at this, passing the nasotical tube with proper lubrication. I have given the airway block, I could be able to give the superior laryngeal nerve block and transtracheal spray. Patient is opening the mouth. I can easily introduce the scope and able to see the glottic structure and I could easily intubate the patient. And look at the patient comfort. Patient is opening his mouth fully, fully alert. So, it's a complex phenomena and whatever we discuss, you just follow that thing and you will get the success. I think because of time concern, we'll discuss these other cases at the last. So I want to discuss about the obesity because, but because of time concern, I'm not going ahead. If time permits, we'll discuss the obesity also. Thank you. Cases that you have in your uh, experience and definitely at the end we will like to see the videos also because it will be useful to the post graduates and the trainees who are watching this uh, webinar but uh, thank you for the lucid presentation and may I now introduce my colleague Dr. Lakshmi she is the lead consultant in our department uh, she is a cardiac anesthetist trained from Cleveland Clinic and she also is a certified uh, echocardiographer over to you Dr. Lakshmi thank you Dr. Sunil um, Thank you, Dr. Apeksh, for uh, sharing your knowledge and also your valuable experience on how to deal with anatomically difficult uh, um, intubations. Um, as he rightly said, you know, difficult airway is well recognized as a clinical entity, um, uh, but it's clinically, traditionally, classically based on uh, anatomic considerations. So, but not until 2012 or 14 that uh, this physiologically difficult airway term gained much of an importance. Um, basic physiologic derangement such as hypoxia, hypotension, right ventricular failure or severe metabolic acidosis, you know when we try to manipulate the airway that poses the patients at risk of cardiovascular collapse, that is where the physiologically difficult airway term gained more of an importance, how to deal with the those kind of patients and how to induce them and how to prevent such patients going arresting post intubation. And also the baseline physiological risk, it uh, it gets exaggerated when we try to intubate them more than once. So as the difficult intubations are quite independent predictors of death, so our goal as an anesthesiologist is always to attempt in uh, have the first pass the high success rate in uh, intubating the patients. When we try to intubate them or attempt them more than uh, once, 
or when these kind of complications, airway complications or the <coughs> hemodynamic instability uh, complications happen and that leads to morbidity mortality. So, this is where we invite our next speaker, Dr. Sheila N. Maitra. Very honored to invite her, um, have her as our second guest speaker. She is going to be dealing with uh, physiologically difficult airways. And she is a professor of anesthesia and intensive care department in one of the Asia's largest cancer hospital, Tata Memorial Cancer Hospital, Mumbai. And she is also president of IDA and past secretary of ISCCM. And she is one of the 14 international experts involved in uh, ASA guidelines and also Puma guidelines. And she is one of the lead author of first published ICU intubation guidelines and unanticipated difficult intubation guidelines. And she is also the lead in task force lead committee. Uh, in an international level and several publications has been added to her credit and also she uh, found one of the best challenging hemodynamic monitor that is tidal volume challenge and uh, honored to invite you Dr. Sheila on our next topic physiologically difficult airway. Over uh, to you Dr. Sheila. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Lakshmi. First of all greetings from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital and from the All India Difficult Airway Association. Uh, it is indeed a great honor for me uh, to speak uh, at this AIG hospital uh, meeting and I wish to thank uh, Dr. Sunil Pandya, Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Pankaj Kumar uh, for having me here. I would rather uh, have uh, wanted to come and meet all of you personally but of course in the current setting this is the best that we can do. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about a topic that's very close to my heart and I'm very happy with the way the program is made because we've already covered uh, the anatomically difficult airway. Now to most people, I mean, when I was a trainee, difficult airway, though like uh, Dr. Apex rightly described, there's nothing like an anatomically difficult airway definition. Nevertheless, I'm sure you all agree, when we said difficult airway, we always thought anatomically difficult. That means it will be technically challenging to get this tube in because of some uh, anatomical uh, problem. We never thought physiologically difficult airway. It is not that physiologically difficult airway, uh, as Dr. Lakshmi has very beautifully described, didn't exist. But this terminology and this phenomena was not highlighted because anesthesiologists largely did um, uh, airway management in the operating room and they always focused on uh, anatomical mm -hmm. Uh, difficulty. So I am going to be focusing on this uh, entity that has been newly coined but a phenomena that has been existing for a long time. So what do we mean really by a physiologically difficult airway? So a physiologically difficult airway by definition is, an, uh, is one in which there, because of the physiological derangements uh, there can be an increased risk and what kind of risk? We are talking about cardiovascular collapse which can increase uh, and death during tracheal intubation and transition into pay po even positive pressure ventilation. Once you put the tube in, you start mechanical ventilation because of the positive pressure, because of the decrease beam circle, again hypotension. So this is a high risk of patients in, we are doing, in which we are doing tracheal intubation and that is why it is very important to recognize uh, this entity that it's not only anatomical difficulty that you may be dealing with an uh, uh, this difficulty in a patient with physiological derangement and there's some special consideration during tracheal intubation in these patients which I'm going to be uh, talking about. So these are the usual steps of uh, you know intubation that we follow. We pre-oxygenate, give anesthesia, muscle relaxant, mass ventilate, laryngoscopy and intubation. Now if the patient has a physiologically difficult airway, Okay, and what we mean by physiologically difficult airway is means that the patient has uh, maybe ARDS or um, some pneumonia or something like an ICU intubation, hypotension already, metabolic acidosis, right ventricular failure. All these are physiological conditions that increase the chance of, uh, as I mentioned, complications during tracheal intubation. So this further increases the chance of hypoxia, hypotension, which leads, leads to, uh, you know, increased morbidity and mortality these patients. But in addition to this, if we also have what Dr. Apex beautifully described, anatomically difficult airway in these patients with a physiologically difficult airway, this can further make the situation very, very complicated. 
So it's time that we recognize this entity and we check whether a patient has a physiologically difficult airway because if they do, we need to adopt certain strategies to uh, you know, imp improve outcomes in these patients. Now, these are usually the sick patients in the intensive care unit or the critically ill patients. You could see them in the ED, in the ICU. Now, these are various uh, series that have looked at these complications, hypoxia, hypotension, esophageal intubation, aspiration, cardiac arrest. And if you look at any of these series, uh, large series, this is the complications, you'll see the complications related uh, to the airway management in the critically ill patients are much higher than what you see in the operating room. And that's not surprising. And this is because of the physiologically uh, difficult airway that makes the risk of complications much higher. So just to explain this to you, if you have a patient uh, you know, with a normal lung versus someone who has, uh, say, an ARDS or a pneumonia, etc. When you're trying to pre-oxygenate both these patients, in one side you're, and you're trying to achieve a certain end title O2, you see that the patient, unlike a patient with a normal lung, you will see that the patient with, uh, you know, say, an ARDS has already starts with a low uh, FRC, and even the content of oxygen is much lower in this uh, uh, patient, though you might give the same amount of pre-oxygenation to both. And this is Benimov's graph. I'm sure all of you have seen it. And it shows very beautifully how these patients have a low FRC. In addition to them, there can be high oxygen consumption. As you know, patients uh, who are uh, critically ill, you know, they may have sepsis, they may have anemia. So there are a lot of things that increase the uh, oxygen demand. And at the same time, the delivery is uh, compromised when there is, uh, you know, cardiac dysfunction, etc. So all this low FRC, high oxygen consumption can re result in an imbalance between the oxygen delivery and the consumption. And they can rapidly desaturate during apnea. So if you look at, uh, you know, after this is the minutes after uh, giving the muscle relaxant, and this is the time to desaturation. And you can see that critically ill patients are somewhere here where they start with a much, uh, you know, a lower saturation and they can actually desaturate very rapidly after you give a muscle relaxant. And, you know, this graph uh, helps you focus on this point that you have very little safe apnea time after you paralyze these patients. And you have to make every attempt not only to, uh, you know, do good pre oxygenation which can help you prolong your safe apnea time, but other methods to prolong your safe apnea time, like apneic oxygenation, and also focus on strategies that can improve your first pass success so that you don't take too much time to secure the airway. So, you know, a focus on this is, is extremely important to understand what we're dealing with in a patient with physiological difficult airway. So then let's go on to strategies to improve outcomes in these patients. Now, starting with airway assessment, like you know, in critically ill patients, it's very difficult to assess the airway and the conventional, like we do in the outpatient department before surgery. And uh, we may we have time to do this and we can perform a whole lot of tests. Now, this is one test that has been developed by Audrey de Jong from France, and it's called the Makocha scoring system. Makocha standing for Malampati, M, A for apnea, so, uh, you know, surviving in spine mobility, opening of the mouth, and coma, presence of hypoxia, and also. Uh, uh, someone who's not trained in anesthesia. So this is what Makocha stands for. And this is very good because not only does it take into account the anatomical difficulty, but it also looks at factors related to pathology, that is coma, severe hypoxemia. And interestingly, even factors related to the operator. So the operator is not an anesthetist. You have one, inc one more point. Uh, and, you know, the score goes up to 12. And as you have an increasing score, this is an increasing difficulty. So this is one of the scores that have been validated in physiologically difficult airway for use in intensive care unit and can be very, uh, you know, quickly performed because, um, we, you know, patients may not be cooperative. You may not be able to do a lot of the assessment. Sometimes even the scores as simple as Mokocha may not be performed. So this is something you can keep in mind to give you some uh, objective assessment of the difficulty of the airway. Now, very, very important, identifying the high risk of complications, the team preparation is extremely important in this situation. Now, we have evidence to show that in patients with a physiologically difficult airway, in ICU intubations, you should have the presence of two operators. And at least one should be skilled in airway management. So this is extremely important. Presence of two operators, one skilled in airway management. Try to use checklists so that you don't have to run around getting things. And you have done not only, you know, kept all your tools for anatomical difficulty, but you've also done physiological optimization if required. Now, very important to have clear communication among the team. 
members, right? Because you must, everyone's roles should be assigned. You must have a good uh, time out and you should say, okay, this is the patient. This is anatomical difficulty. This is the physiological difficulty I'm anticipating. If this happens, this is what we do. This is how we're going to secure the airway. And if we fail to intubate this patient, then we're going to put in a supraglottic airway. Or if we're, you know, this is what you will do. This is what, so everything has to be planned in advance. So you have an airway plan. Then you have a backup plan if it doesn't work. And each uh, and every per team member's roles and responsibilities should be uh, identified um, prior. So, and it's also uh, regarding positions, it's also again controversial whether they should give uh, sniffing position or backup position. Definitely not keeping the patient flat, but little elevation. Uh, will help you oxygenate better the basis of the lung and uh, you know better pre-oxygenation and better optimization of the patient and so you try to pre-oxygenate them in a head elevated uh, position. Coming to pre-oxygenation I already told you that these patients are at a high risk of desaturation and very short apnea time so we try to give them optimum pre-oxygenation. Now earlier we used to give this using a face mask but now we have two more tools in our armamentarium. One, one is non-invasive ventilation and we have high flow nasal cannula oxygen. Now non-invasive ventilation what we mean is you're already intubating this patient and putting them on a ventilator so you already have the ventilator circuit ready. So instead of just pre-oxygenating using a face mask what you could do is you could give him pressure support along with this some peep. So you allow the patient to breathe spontaneously and you give non-invasive ventilation, you set a pressure support and you give some peep to this patient. Or what you could do is you could give high flow nasal cannula oxygen, pre-oxygenate with this. And the benefit of this is you can continue apneic oxygenation, which means you can pre-oxygenate with high flow nasal cannula oxygen when the patient is spontaneously breathing. And once you paralyze the patient and there's apnea, you could continue with this nasal cannula during attempts at intubation. So this not only helps this optimum pre oxygenation will help you prolong the safe apnea time and the apneic oxygenation will further help you prolong the safe apnea time in this high risk group of patients. So let us look at what is the evidence today with these methods of uh, pre oxygenation. Now, is there any evidence for this non-invasive ventilation to improve the pre oxygenation? Now, this is a very old study, but what they found is when they give non-invasive invasive ventilation and again I mean pressure support and PEEP and they compared it with just using uh, you know your non-invasive back valve mask and uh, this was a control group and they tried to look at the saturation after pre-oxygenation during trach intubation how many episodes of less than 80 saturation and what was the saturation after five minutes of tracheal intubation and what did they find they, they found that there was significantly higher uh, saturation during trach intubation when the patient was pre-oxygenated using non-invasive ventilation and also the episodes of saturation falling less than 80 percent was uh, much lower in patients who got non-invasive so compared to your conventional oxygen therapy definitely non-invasive ventilation is more superior in these high-risk patients with lung pathology critically ill already having pneumonias, already having ARDS, a more superior form of non-invasive ventilation. And uh, Dr. Punk, uh, Pink has already talked about high flow nasal cannula uh, oxygen. So uh, you're giving flows from between 50 to 70 liters and you can't give dry oxygen at such high flows. So this is heated and humidified oxygen that you're giving to these patients and you're pre-oxygenating with them. And then you continue this during attempts at tracheal intubation. So these two techniques, have they been you know, compared head on? So this is the Florali 2 trial that was done recently. And this is the first head on comparison of non-invasive ventilation with high flow nasal cannula oxygen uh, that was used for pre-oxygenation and the non-invasive high flow nasal cannula oxygen was continued during attempts at intubation. They did a randomized controlled trial. This was a multicentric trial that was uh, conducted um, in France. And what did they find? They actually found the primary outcome was episodes of saturation falling less than 80% uh, uh, during the procedure. And if you look at the p-value, they didn't find any difference between whether non-invasive ventilation was used or high flow nasal cannula in a ventilation was used. But what was interesting is that in the high risk group, that means patients who had PAO2, FiO2 ratio less than 200, they found that non-invasive ventilation was superior to high flow nasal cannula oxygen. So in moderate to severe risk patients, perhaps there's a role for non-invasive ventilation. And this is because uh, you can give uh, better PEEP in patients in whom you use non-invasive ventilation compared to high flow nasal cannula. In high flow nasal cannula, you can give about four to seven uh, PEEP, but again, the mouth has to be closed. If the mouth is open, then you lose the uh, PEEP effect. And this is a very interesting study. It's called the Optinif trial. This was a proof of concept study. It came from France, from the group of Samir Jaber. Now, they did something very interesting. 
they said, okay, you have this high risk group of patients who rapidly desaturate. So why don't we use a combination of non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula oxygen, considering that high flow nasal non-invasive ventilation pre-oxygenation may be superior to high flow nasal cannula oxygen. Very nice randomized controlled trial, but of course, in a small number of patients, it's a proof of concept study, and they did very, very nice uh, blinding, you know. So in one group, they used only non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation. And in the other group, they used non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation, but they added high flow nasal cannula oxygen for the apneic oxygenation. That means during attempt set intubation. And they found that the combination of a two was much superior to using just non-invasive ventilation alone for pre-oxygenation. Again, this has needs to be studied in a larger group of patients, but uh, you know, it's it's definitely something promising and something that may be very futuristic and what we probably should consider in these very high risk of um, patients. So this is a review that we wrote in intensive care medicine, and I was very fortunate to write this with Audrey De Jong and Jonathan Casey. And we wrote this in May 2020. And this is just a figure in that from that review, which summarizes the role whole of um, non-invasive respiratory support before and after mechanical ventilation in these patients, uh, you know, who come with respiratory failure. So if you're not intubating and they just come with respiratory failure, you can consider either NIV or high flow nasal cannula oxygen to avoid an intubation. You know, sometimes uh, like you use NIV as probably a bridge to intubation or even, you know, to tide over and, you know, avoid an intubation or delay an intubation the same way you can use high flow nasal cannula oxygen. This is definitely superior to conventional oxygen therapy. And whether one is better than the other is still debatable. Now, this is the initial oxygenation strategies in a patient with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Now, if you come to tracheal intubation, so for tracheal intubation, if you talk about pre oxygenation, then pre oxygenation with NIV, as I mentioned, is superior to high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And this is in patients with moderate to severe hypoxemia. I mean, patients with PaO2, FiO2 ratio less than 200. But definitely both these techniques are superior to conventional oxygen therapy. We should continue apneic oxygenation. And uh, also I will speak about this later, mask ventilation, even during rapid sequence intubation, should be performed in this high risk risk group of patients because of the high chance of desaturation and complications related to this. This is tracheal intubation. Uh, then coming to extubation, Dr. Peksh already spoke very nicely about strategies for extubation difficult patients. But in patients with physiologically difficult airway, there is a role of extubating directly onto non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And this is especially in high risk groups. And this is this will help you prevent the incidence of uh, reintubation. So this is just summarizing the role of the various non-invasive uh, respiratory support that we have available in armamentarium and how we could use this to uh, optimize the peri-intubation oxygenation in, our, in this high risk group of patients. The other complication that's very common is hypotension. And, um, you know, uh, drugs like ketamine and atomidate have come back into the ICU. Those of you who are anesthetists, you know that ketamine is not a very good drug we use in anesthesia. We have many, many better drugs, uh, you know, which are very uh, superior. And ketamine is almost out in the operating room. But this drug found its way back into the intensive care unit after this landmark trial, which was published in The Lancet. And they uh, used ketamine and they compared it with atomidate for rapid sequence intubation in critically ill. Now, why ketamine and atomidate? Because these are more cardiostable drugs. Now, what happens in critically ill patients is that they are very often septic, they have, uh, you know, distributive kind of shock. They're hypovolemic. They have hypotension. And when you give agents like propofol and other agents that will cause vasodilation, they have precipitous fall in blood pressure, which can lead to hypotension, you know, cardiac arrest, arrhythmias, and all kinds of complications. And often because they are hypoxic, they're very tachycardic, and their blood pressure is kind of maintained because of the sympathetic drive. But the moment you intubate them, you will, you know, you induce them, you will see that this drive is lost, and then they have fall in blood pressure. And this is the reason these two agents have been used. And this trial actually found no difference in the mean SOFA scores in the first three days, no difference in intubating conditions. However, patients uh, with ad uh, more adrenal insufficiency in patients with uh, atomidate was seen in this trial. Now, subsequently, there have has been another study this was done in the emergency department with almost 1000 patients and these patients with uh, which were induced with ketamine had um, you know more icu free days ventilator free days and hospital mortality and very similar to those that were induced with etomidate now this is another very interesting study so you have i've already 
told you about agents, you should try to use ketamine or etomidate unless contraindicated. Now, another in very interesting study, and this was done in Vanderbilt, and this was a randomized controlled trial. Now, all along to avoid this kind of hypotension and, you know, uh, being aware of this, we've always tried to preload the flu with patients with 500 ml of uh, uh, saline before intubation because we know very often in critically ill they might have hypotension. So this was a randomized controlled trial that was done in 337 patients and they randomized the patient to either receive 500 ml of crystalloid or no fluid bolus before intubation. And the primary outcome was cardiovascular collapse after intubation. And it was very interesting because the administration of intravenous fluid bolus did not, uh, you know, decrease the overall incidence of cardiovascular co collapse compared to no fluid at all. So this actually, uh, you know, challenges our current practice. And perhaps, perhaps there is a role of the early use of vasopressors in these patients over, um, you know, giving fluids. And this is something that we need to consider in future in this high risk group of patients where hypotension is very, very common. I'll tell you something about direct sequence intubation. Now, what is direct sequence intubation? We know about rapid sequence intubation. Now, when you see critically ill patients, it's, you know, they're very high risk for hypoxia. But at the same time, they can be very rowdy, very difficult to pre oxygenate And you know how important pre oxygenation is in these patients. So you can use ketamine to facilitate the pre oxygenation in patients who are very agitated. So rather than just try to intubate them, you give them ketamine. And we're talking about sleep doses of ketamine, like say one milligram per kg of ketamine. And then you pre oxygenate need them and ketamine you know it preserves the airway reflexes the respiratory drive and also the blood pressure so in these are the patients who fail to pre oxygenate okay then you can give them sedative dose of ketamine oxygenate them well and then you decide whether you want to do uh, you know rapid sequence intubation or you can do uh, without relaxant you can do awake intubation or perhaps you won't need any intubation at all so this is what we mean by direct sequence uh, intubation this has been studied by uh, scott weingard and this is a term that is coined by him and they've done a prospective observational trial and demonstrated the feasibility of this technique. Now, rapid sequence intubation. Now, critically ill patients are considered as full stomach. Of course, some of them may be full stomach. They must have had a whole meal and come. Uh, but also because of the gastroparesis of uh, critical illness, they may be diabetic, etc. So the rule, uh, you know, default is always to do a rapid sequence intubation, get the tube in as early as possible so that you can avoid uh, the risk of palmary aspiration with ventilation. Now, is it uh, good to do rapid sequence intubation? Did, does the uh, muscle relaxant helping, uh, you know, giving this benefit? So this was an old study that's compared rapid sequence intubation versus not giving muscle relaxant at all. And if you look at any of the complications that we're talking about, it was much lower in patients in whom muscle relaxant was given. So RSI does significantly reduce the complications of emergency airway management and should be practiced by uh, physicians. And if you look at the various agents that have used and this is a more recent study looking at neuromuscular blockade versus not. And if you look at, you know, the important complications, hypoxemia, etc., was much lower in patients in whom uh, neuromuscular blocking agents were used. And if you compare the different agents, whether you should use succinylcholine or ocuronium uh, in these patients, there was no difference when these two agents were compared in terms of first attempt intubation success, CL grade, or even the POGO score. So the important message is that in this high risk group of patients, there is a benefit of doing rapid sequence intubation. But again, the question is that they desaturate very rapidly after giving the muscle relaxant. And this is the landmark paper from Jonathan Casey on bag mass ventilation during tracheal intubation. So when you're doing RSI, conventionally, we don't give mass ventilation because of the perceived risk of aspiration if you give mask ventilation. So what they did in this study is very interesting. In one group of patients, they didn't give mask ventilation. And in the other group of patients, they gave gentle mask ventilation. Because see, understand, these are patients who are at very risk, high risk of hypoxemia. So there's a perceived risk of aspiration. And on the other side, there's a high risk of hypoxemia, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, and death. So in patients who are critically ill with the physiological difficulty, Airway, you give a gentle mask ventilation uh, in patients, especially who are at risk for desaturation. And what did they find? Obviously, in the patients they ventilated, uh, you know, there was a significantly higher saturation in these patients without any increase in the risk of aspiration. Of course, this study wasn't powered to look for aspiration, but it definitely gives us some confidence in this critically ill group of patients that you could uh, mask ventilate these patients, especially at the high risk for the uh, saturation. Coming to tools, and this is very interesting because, you know, video laryngoscope is a new tool now, we all use it. Now, these are uh, the early meta-analysis that compared video laryngoscope with direct laryngoscope for orotracheal intubation. And this was done outside the um, 
operating room, so it included both critically and non-critically ill patients, and they found better first plus success. However, they found the incidence of complications higher in those you know uh, in whom uh, video laryngoscopy was used. And this is a more recent meta-analysis of nine randomized controlled trials that have been done by uh, Cambridge. And interestingly, video laryngoscope is clearly beneficial over direct laryngoscope in the operating room. Uh, even in routine airway management, difficult airway management, but in intense critically ill patients, there was no difference in uh, the first pass success, uh, whether a video laryngoscope was used or a direct laryngoscope was used, and even when they looked at the experience of, of the operator. Now, why is this? The tool is the same that you're using in the operating room and you're using in the uh, ICU. So why is it that the same video laryngoscope does not perform as well? And the real reason is the physiologically difficult airway. So, you know, in the operating room, you can often give uh, someone a little more time to do the intubation, whereas these patients, if you prolong the time to intubation, and when you use a video laryngoscope, you have an excellent view. You know, I'm sure all of you know, but passing the tube is not that easy. So in a normal airway, this will be fine, because even if you take some time, it's okay. But in a patient with a physiologically difficult airway, they can rapidly desaturate. So the complications are not because of, uh, you know, the tool, but because you need more, you need to understand that these patients have physically, physiologically difficult airway. And, you know, because you have this excellent view, you don't abort attempts at intubation, you go on and on and trying. This may be okay in a normal patient, but may not be well tolerated. So we definitely need future better studies that will better define the role of this. And Professor Samir Jaber has very beautifully summarized this, uh, the role of video laryngoscopes in ICU. He said video laryngoscopes, they are a heterogeneous entry. They improve the Gottlieb visualization, allow, uh, you know, and, uh, allow the supervision, of course, that makes it very easy for intubation. But video laryngoscopy for every intubation in ICU cannot yet be recommended. Nevertheless, a video laryngoscope should be available in ICU. It's a powerful tool to rescue difficult airway. There's no doubt about the role of video laryngoscopy in uh, difficult airway. And future trials will better define the role of video laryngoscopes in ICU. This is another very uh, important trial that was done in the emergency department. And it's done by the group of Driver et al. And what they've done is something very interesting. In patients with at least one anatomical sign of difficulty they used either a bougie uh, you know used a bougie directly that you do laryngoscopy put in a bougie and slide the tube over in one arm and the other arm they use a tracheal tube which was already preloaded with a stylet and what did they find they looked at the first intubation success uh, rate and of course this was patients in whom had they had one characteristics of difficulty and what they found is that in patients who you they use a bougie up front they had better first intubation success compared to using the uh, stylet. Now, the study they were is a single center study, and they were also criticized because this was a group that was very experienced with the use of Bougie. Nevertheless, it gives you some, uh, you know, a good clear message that if you're experienced with the use of Bougie, perhaps using a Bougie upfront in these patients uh, is better than, you know, when you're failing intubation and then using a Bougie in this patient. So this can be another tool that can help you improve your first pass attempt. I cannot overemphasize limiting in terms of intubation. We have to make every attempt to limit the intubation. More attempts, more will be the complications. This will not be tolerated uh, in patients like in the normal uh, patients, the physiologically difficult airway patients they will have if you look at all the complications when the attempts were more than two uh, was significantly higher because the risk ratio then uh, when the limits were uh, attempts were limited to less than two and the important message from this is limit the intubation attempts to uh, less than two importance of using capnography now even a single episode of trick, uh, esophageal intubation can lead to 51% hypoxemia in this high-risk group. And if the attempts are more than two intub ex uh, esophageal intubation, 85%. Uh, so, uh, you know, unlike uh, in the operating room where you have a junior trainee puts in the tube in the esophagus, you take it out, you mask ventilate, you give him another try. This is not tolerated in patients with physiologically difficult airway. They rapidly desaturate and you'll have a lot of complications. So you must use capnography to diagnose esophageal intubation early. And I'm sure you're all aware of the NAP4 project. This was a NAP national audit project that looked at airway complications, not only in the operating room, but outside the operating room. And this is a subgroup that, of the data that looked at the ICU data. And they had 184 complications. And what is interesting is more than 60% of the events in ICU led to death or brain damage compared to only 14% in anesthesia. And these events were more likely to happen out of hours when they were managed by uh, doctors with less anesthetic experience and they led to permanent harm. So failure to use capnography actually 
um, you know, contributed to 74% of the deaths and persistent neurological damage. And this emphasizes the role of captography in this high risk of patients. And then coming to rescue oxygenation, of course, you have all these pre oxygenation strategies. But remember, when you fail to ventilate or oxygenate, you must have your rescue strategies in line. You limit attempts, that's most important. Don't go and on trying to intubate in these patients. Use mask ventilation between the attempts to restore oxygen saturation. And now, Jonathan Casey's uh, study has given us some confidence in performing gentle mask ventilation. If you fail this, use a suprocratic airway device. And if you cannot intubate, you cannot ventilate, you have complete ventilation failure, you must use uh, emergency cricothyrotomy. I'll very quickly run you through the first guideline for tracheal intubation that was made. And I'm very proud to say that this came from the All India Difficulty Airway Association, acknowledging the fact that tracheal intubation in the operating room is not the same in the intensive care unit where you have physiological difficulty. And this is what the algorithm looks like. I'll very quickly put you through this, but all the points that I've talked about, all the strategies that are different in optimizing uh, these patients have been highlighted to them. The first part is pre -oxygenation. As I mentioned, we've talked about two uh, operators optimizing the pre -oxygenation, not only by conventional oxygen therapy, but using high flow, using NIV, drugs, etomidate or ketamine, with choline or rocuronium unless contraindicated and giving gentle even before jonathan casey uh, did his study we had already advocated the use of gentle mask ventilation uh, in these high risk group of patients and of course there are two situations mask ventilation is successful or unsuccessful if it is successful then uh, you know, you continue with your laryngoscopy. If you're able to get the tube in, you confirm the tracheal intubation with capnography. I've just highlighted the importance of uh, this. If your face mask ventilation is unsuccessful, then one, one trial attempt at tracheal intubation. Now, if despite this, you have done your two attempts and still you have failed your intubation, then you try to rescue the, you know, the uh, situation using a failed, uh, you know, we call it a failed ventilation uh, through the, uh, and you try to put in a suprotic airway device. And again, with the, the suprapodotic airway device, maximum two attempts. Like with the tube, maximum two attempts. Now, if you're able to put in a suprapodotic airway device, remember one fundamental difference between these patients and patients in the operating room is that you cannot wake up the patient. You cannot say, OK, I'm not doing this case. I'm going to postpone it and do it next time. So you need a definitive airway in critically ill patients. He's come to you because of a pneumonia. He's come to you because of the RDS. You cannot postpone this. You need a definitive airway in. So if you're able well, to mask mentally with a suprapodotic airway device, either you do a percutaneous tracheostomy or surgical tracheostomy, or if you have someone who's killed and you have a bronchoscope, you can intubate through the suprapodotic airway device and um, put in a tube. But if you don't have a uh, bronchoscope and you don't have someone with expertise to intubate through a suprapodotic airway device, you shouldn't attempt to do this. And remember, never remove that suprapodotic airway device that has helped you with the rescue mask ventilation because you will not be able, perhaps able to put it back in again if you're not able to intubate uh, again. And if you fail this, of course, it's a failed ventilation through suprapodotic airway device. And then you can give uh, a muscle relaxant if the patient has come out of this. And if you're successful in ventilating, this is your last best attempt at ventilation. If you're successful at this, then we can do a surgical or percutaneous tracheostomy. Again, I'm telling you, you cannot bail out because you have to do a definitive airway. And if this also fails, then we have a situation called complete ventilation failure, where your best attempt with intubation, suprapodotic airway device, and mask ventilation have all failed. And in this situation, we, we call it complete ventilation failure. You call for additional help. And you can do one of the techniques for emergency cricothyrotomy, that is either surgical, wide bore, or needle cricothyrotomy. Uh, these two first two are possible. Needle cricothyrotomy is not possible in the intensive care unit because you know you need transtracheal jacket ventilation. It's not only about getting the needle inside. And once you are able to oxygenate the patient, then you should convert this to a tracheostomy because cricothyrotomy, you know, there are chances of subclotic stenosis. So you can't keep this for more than 24 hours. And most important, when you've had this stormy kind of intubation in this patient with a physiologically difficult airway, the post-procedure plan is very important. Further airway management plan, treat the edema if suspected, monitor for complications because you could have complications. And one thing which we often fail to do is counsel the patient or his family and uh, you know because this patient might go again and get critically ill or go for surgery again and they should know about the complications that have uh, occurred so this is what the algorithm looks like and this is a recent uh, review that i've written in current opinion in clinical air care it's just uh, published in jan 2020 where i summarized all these strategies that i've just outlined uh, for the management of the physiologically difficult airway so i'll summarize by saying that patients with a physiologically difficult airway have increased complications and we need to recognize this we cannot intubate them in the same way as we do in the operating room 
uh, a normal airway or even the anatomically difficult airway. You're not going to secure this airway and expect hypotension in this patient, but anticipate these complications. Hypoxemia, hypoxia and hypotension are the most common complications in these patients. And you must make every attempt to mitigate, to avoid and to mitigate these complications and treat them uh, you know, very judiciously to avoid further complications. So you can do this with careful planning and preparation with the specific strategies that, I, uh, that I've just outlined to employ these, uh, you know, complications. And these include peri-intubation oxygenation, more superior oxygenation, use high flow, use non vasoventilation, ventilation, use apneic oxygenation, fluids and vasopressors to avoid and also treat hypotension. You know, use employ strategies to increase first pass success, experience operator, video laryngoscopy, bougies, etc. Limit your intubation attempts. Use capnography to identify, you know, diagnose, you know, make sure that you're in the trachea and not in the esophagus. And use the rescue oxygenation strategies early as appropriate. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Wherever you are listening to me, take care, stay safe. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sheila. Thank you so much for the detailed presentation and also for your valuable recommendations based on mostly evidence-based and also based on your experience, how to uh, manage these physical, physiologically difficult airways, um, have a smooth induction, prepping them properly, and also most importantly, um, without uh, much of hemodynamic complications. And thanks a lot. That was a very detailed presentation. And as you rightly said, the team approach and also having a careful preparation and planning and also most importantly having a plan B if at all plan A fails I think helps a lot and also minimizes most of our uh, airway complications. Um, here comes our uh, next speaker Dr. Pankaj Kumar and uh, he uh, did his MD anesthesia from Jipmer and has been associated with AIG since 2012 and one of our best anesthesiologists in our department. And he'll be discussing a couple of uh, case presentations which we dealt with uh, uh, both physiologically and anatomically difficult airways that we dealt in our department. And after the discussion, then the floor will be open for uh, questions because we already received a couple of uh, actually more of questions <laughs> regarding our uh, topic today. So over to you, Dr. Pankaj. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Dr. Pankaj. So uh, today I'm going to discuss a few uh, interesting cases uh, which we had managed uh, in AIG. So the first case, uh, as you can see, is a 65 year old male patient who came with a history of uh, abdominal pain and was diagnosed uh, have symptomatic gallstones and uh, he was posted for uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy surgery. So this patient, uh, he had a history of uh, neck stiffness, difficulty in neck movements for since the past two years and uh, severity of the neck, and the neck symptoms, uh, they started increasing with time. So as you can see, uh, his airway examination revealed uh, mouth opening was uh, 3 centimeters, malampati grade 3, neck extension was nil flick, uh, fixed flexion deformity, uh, neck hanging uh, above the level of uh, below and uh, the thyromental distance uh, less than 4 centimeters. So this patient uh, diagnosed to have ankylosing spondylitis. Now the surgery posted was laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So with the team discussion with the surgeon and uh, our anesthesia team, we, uh, we were uh, thinking whether to go for uh, segmental spinal versus fiber optic or video laryngoscopic guided uh, intubation. So after discussion, uh, anyway, uh, we had uh, finally decided uh, after pro con discussion for a definitive secured airway with general anesthesia and endotracheal intubation. So on the day of surgery in the pre-op area, again, uh, the airway was uh, examined uh, by our senior consultant. And uh, then we plan to do a check video laryngoscopy uh, under local anesthetic spray in the pre-op area to see whether uh, we will be able to secure the airway with a video laryngoscopy or do we directly need to go for uh, awake fiber optic intubation since the mouth opening uh, was adequate. So the patient was explained the procedure that what we are going <coughs> to do and uh, we have taken consent. So 10% lignocaine spray, 3 to 4 puffs were given orally. Uh, to anesthetize the postpharyngeal wall, the base of the tongue, and uh, the patient was uh, made supine and uh, adequate uh, head and neck support was provided. And uh, check video laryngoscopy uh, was done, and we could visualize the epiglottis. 
so uh, we were confident that uh, with slight uh, burp and with uh, slight pressure we would be able to you know visualize the vocal cords after induction so we planned for a modified uh, rapid sequence induction with uh, video laryngoscopic guided intubation so uh, after giving uh, 1 mg midazolam in the pre op area we shifted the patient inside OT and uh, they have connected all the monitors ecg uh, nibp pulse oximetry difficult airway card uh, with all the necessary airway equipment there is a oropharyngeal nasopharyngeal airways video laryngoscope uh, routine scopes UG, stillet and uh, suction equipment everything kept ready and all the emergency drugs were also loaded and kept ready and uh, uh, for anti-silagog effect we have given a uh, glycopyrrolate 0.3 mg IV then we started a uh, pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen then after adequate pre-oxygenation we induced the patient uh, with uh, fentanyl propofol and succinyl choline uh, doses according to the body weight then uh, mask ventilation uh, was adequate after uh, uh, inserting a oropharyngeal airway so we did, uh, we did gentle mask ventilation, bag and mask ventilation and after 60 seconds uh, video laryngoscope was introduced and uh, we could secure the airway uh, with an 8 size endotracheal tube and uh, then it was connected to the circuit and tube position was uh, confirmed with checking the capnography and uh, <coughs> chest wall movements. So this is after intubation, this picture uh, shows that we had to keep uh, additional pillows and uh, we need to support the neck of the patient because it was hanging. So the duration of surgery was uh, one hour without any complications and we uh, prepared the same like uh, whatever we kept ready for intubation, everything was kept ready during even extubation because extubation is also uh, important and tricky in these patients. So once the patient was fully awake and we commands, we could uh, extubate the patient. So uh, this uh, slide, it shows that uh, we have modified rapid sequence induction with bag and mask ventilation. As you can see on the left side, uh, there is apnea, then gentle mask ventilation. You can see the ETCO2 and the airway pressures we minimized. Uh, the peak airway pressure is around 15 and uh, the platelet pressure is around 12. So the second slide shows that we were able to uh, maintain that bag and mask ventilation uh, with uh, peak airway pressures maintaining less than 20 for a period of uh, 60 seconds. After which uh, we did a video laryngoscope we intubated. So this video, it shows a brief video showing uh, how we secured the airway in this patient. <coughs> yes. <coughs> right. So uh, in our hospital, uh, apart from the operation theater, we also uh, have managed the surgical ICU and uh, we are on night calls and uh, so 24 hour coverage of surgical ICU is provided by our team. So uh, the second case I'm going to present is uh, a case where uh, we have a patient who was immediately shifted from the ward to the surgical ICU. So he was a 28 year old male patient. It was a known case of ulcerative colitis, uh, chronic disease. He was already on chronic uh, steroid therapy and uh, so he was having uh, immunocompromised and he was uh, severely malnourished and uh, his PPOSM score uh, was around 36 with a predicted mortality of 70%. So this patient uh, was supposedly admitted in the ward uh, getting evaluated for an elective surgery. This patient suddenly he had presented uh, with severe hemodynamic instability and desaturation. So they have shifted this patient to the surgical ICU. So in the surgical ICU, clinically, after assisting the patient, patient was febrile and uh, sensorium, he was still responding to commands, but he was having a severe tachycardia, hypotension, tachypnea, and uh, he was not maintaining a saturation uh, even with the non reproducible mask. And uh, on auscultation, he was having a bilateral basal crepes and uh, his urine output was decreasing and uh, his parabdomen, uh, it was very distended, guarding, rigidity were present. So he was, clinically he was showing signs of uh, perforation. So, and his blood gases, we did a blood gas, it was showing severe metabolic acidosis with, uh, and he was trying to compensate with uh, hyperventilation. And uh, his PO2 was also low with a uh, PFR ratio of 111. And uh, he was also having hyperkalemia. So this picture of severe metabolic acidosis and uh, spending ARDS and septic shock. So this patient was like a physiologically difficult airway to be managed. So immediately after the patient was sealed inside the surgical ICU, uh, everything, the emergency drug card, defibrillator, everything was uh, like checked and uh, brought to the patient. 
bed and uh, the difficult airway trolley everything was arranged and immediately we had to secure the airway of this patient because uh, he was going to like uh, any time he could uh, collapse and he could arrest so immediately we needed to decrease the cardiopulmonary workload so uh, so with help assistant so one of the staff they had started securing the uh, peripheral lines and uh, immediately we brought the ultrasound and uh, we started doing a lung ultrasound as well as abdominal to assess the fluid status okay whether the, this patient will respond to fluids okay looking at the ivc looking at the heart so we we saw that the, this patient was fluid depleted so immediately we started fluid resuscitation uh, with crystalloids initially then even uh, we started uh, noradrenaline adrenaline infusions were also prepared and connected and we were uh, prepared for any crash intubation and even adrenaline boluses uh, 100 microgram per uh, cc was loaded in a 10 mm syringe and uh, kept ready in case we needed to uh, give any boluses arterial line uh, was secured and the pulse was still feeble but we could secure an arterial line with ultrasound guidance and it was transfused and uh, our plan was uh, modified uh, rapid sequence induction with intubation so uh, before uh, planning for intubation uh, we uh, connected the patient to our ventilator with an niv mask and we initiated a uh, non invasive positive pressure ventilation initially to increase the uh, physiological uh, reserve because the uh, definitely this patient was tachypneic so his uh, functional residual capacity would have been very low so uh, so we did non invasive ventilation for around 15 minutes uh, then but still the patient was severe distress so we plan to intubate him after 15 minutes. So the transition was made to Bain circuit. We connect a Bain circuit uh, and with the APL wall uh, slightly closed, we could maintain adequate seal and beep. And immediately, uh, since this patient was uh, chronic steroid therapy, uh, we gave 100, uh, 200 mg hydrocot. Then uh, we induced the patient with uh, adequate dose of ketamine and uh, rocuronium since he was having a hyperkalemia. And uh, we could secure the airway uh, with eight size endocate tube, and uh, tube position was confirmed immediately with uh, ETCO2 and uh, chest wall movement. Cuff pressure was also checked, uh, tube was fixed and connected to the ventilator. And uh, yeah, immediately after uh, intubation uh, for a brief period of time, he had a slight hypotension and desaturation, which uh, we could manage uh, with 100% oxygen and with the uh, vasopressor uh, boluses and noradrenaline uh, purge, we could uh, pick up the BP and once the patient was stabilized in the ICU. We had taken him for emergency laparotomy surgery after stabilizing him. So this was about the uh, second uh, case which we had uh, recently managed uh, showing the physiological difficult airway. And uh, next uh, I'm going to just show a, a few pictures showing uh, other few cases which we had uh, managed in our hospital. So this patient uh, you can see this is a bariatric patient who came for bariatric surgery. So you can see on the left side, uh, this patient has uh, literally no neck, okay, very short neck, increased neck sound appearance. So these patients are uh, very difficult, anatomically difficult airway. And uh, so for this patient, uh, this is the ramp position which we use in our hospital to appropriate pos position these patients before intubation. And uh, showing the intubating aids which we have like uh, the intubating LMA, the ProSeal LMA and uh, this uh, recently we, where we used uh, Thrive uh, to, like for pre-oxygenation in a patient uh, for a bariatric patient where we used Thrive to pre-oxygenate then uh, we intubated the patient. So this shows like uh, for 4 minutes uh, we continuously at 60 liters at 4 bar pressure we gave the uh, high flow nasal oxygen. And uh, after 60 seconds, uh, okay, we could see that the saturation slowly came down to 95. And uh, after 90 seconds, the uh, saturation came down to 90. But at this point, we did a video laryngoscope and uh, we could uh, successfully uh, intubate the patient. So this was uh, one of the slides showing uh, that uh, we had used Thrive for intubating a patient for bariatric surgery. And in our hospital, uh, not only we manage OT and we, uh, we also uh, help in difficult intubations uh, outside the operation theater also like in medical ICU, ER, ward. So uh, this is uh, just a statistics uh, showing the various uh, difficult airways which we had managed both anatomically, physiologically uh, difficult airways which we had managed in the past two years. So as you can see the various types of surgeries and the different uh, intubating aids which we had used like obese patients coming for bariatric, non-bariatric surgery neck restriction, patients with restricted mouth opening, patients with 
physiological difficult airway both anatomical and physiological difficult airway and uh, here we are showing uh, anticipated difficult airway where uh, af uh, after uh, induction uh, the airway was couldn't be secured by uh, one of our colleagues so we needed uh, two person three person help and uh, by exchanging hands and by using video laryngoscope uh, direct scope finally uh, we could intubate these patients and uh, in only one patient uh, was posted for lab fully we had to awaken the patient and uh, postpone the surgery because uh, this patient uh, we could not intubate so we awakened the patient and uh, we uh, did the surgery at a later date so the take home message is uh, okay so the dogmas in airway management are as an anesthesiologist and a perioperative physician uh, we take care of the operation theater and the surgical ICU. So we need to stick a balance between evidence that is what is the recent evidence guidelines. We need to update ourselves and uh, when we are doing such cases, we need to uh, see the patient use our common sense as well. And uh, we have to overcome our bad habits which we have acquired and we need to update ourselves and we should overcome the fear of difficult airway and so that we can manage it better. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pankaj, uh, for this uh, case discussions. Uh, uh, Dr. Apex, are you ready with your videos or will you just move yes. to the... You have the videos ready? I am ready. Yeah, can, we, can, we, uh, can you just... Uh, I, must tell you the, I must tell the audience that uh, Dr. Apex has also invented a Patwasha video laryngoscopic blade and uh, it will be soon for uh, commercial usage uh, at a very, very... A low cost, uh, but yes, that's a original research that they have done at uh, Cancer Institute at Vadodara. Dr. Apex, over to you for uh, brief videos. So subsequently, we can uh, open the floor for discussion. Yeah, just, I'll just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? I can see your image screen now. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, now? Yeah, you can, you can see the screen now, yes. So, can we discuss this case of obesity? Yeah, we can discuss, we can discuss, yes. It's a uh, uh, BMI of 53 with uh, 165 kg weight. Next circumference 47, Malampati grade 4. Extension was possible. So, how we should plan? Should we keep it open for discussion? Yeah, yeah. You can you can show the video clipping if you if you have. I am having video clipping of video laryngoscope in this case and uh, another case I am having a uh, uh, collapse during the inspiration in spontaneous video. I will show you later once we start with the discussion. Okay. So, uh, basically one of the question from uh, the audience from Karnur is, I will direct yeah. it to Dr. Apex, how to buy a good video laryngoscope which is economically viable in a low volume setup? Uh, first and foremost, it, wherever you are working, whether it is a low volume setup or high volume setup, do not compromise on the patient's safety. That is one, one important thing. And if you are uh, buying, uh, plan to buy a video laryngoscope, then ideally uh, buy with the anatomically cow blade. There are different type of video laryngoscope are available, American trust type of blade, uh, uh, anatomically cow blade. Usually go with the anatomically cow blade. And nowadays, usually video laryngoscope are ranging between 90,000 90, to lakh at the most. However, CMAC is quite expensive, but it's also having an anatomically curved blade, like deep blade. Okay. So, this is question, Dr. Sheila, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So, this is the come from Bijapur, Dr. Samuel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His question is a case of acute abdomen uh, that walked, uh, Pankaj presented, uh, perioder, suspected peritonitis for laparotomy, malampati grade for restricted neck movements. Uh, advanced airway devices are not available. Hemodynamically also unstable on noradrenaline. What would be your airway management plan? Right. So this kind of patient, you said the the one that he presented was restricted neck movements. You said. Yeah, restricted neck movements and malampati grade four. 
Yeah. So this kind of patient is really challenging because this is anatomically as well as a physiologically difficult airway. So you shouldn't jump into this without proper planning. Now the case that he said is at a risk for hypotension, is at a risk for um, you know uh, um, hypoxia, and also uh, there is severe mes metabolic acidosis. So you have to be careful about severe metabolic acidosis because even this is um, physiologically difficult airway. So what happens is when these patients, you know, when you have severe metabolic acidosis, the component of the um, organic acids uh, increase in proportion to the um, you know non-organic acids, and the spontaneous respiration helps uh, you know keep the minute ventilation and wash out the CO2. Now the moment you uh, make them lose their respiratory drive, what happens is there's increase in the production of CO2, further worsening of the acidosis and this can result in arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, death. So this metabolic acidosis is also something that you can take, uh, take seriously. Now this is a patient of septic shock, so distributive shock, uh, you know there is relative hypovolemia. So do not attempt intubation without optimizing this patient first, optimizing in terms of hemodynamics. So I would start vasopressors early. I think vasopressors were already started. Fluid loading this patient is very important and early use of vasopressors. Uh, so the, you know, not trying to just correct the pH, but uh, optimizing the uh, fluid therapy. And then in terms of um, uh, securing the airway and coming to this uh, anatomical difficulty. Now here your patient is likely, because he's hypoxic, he's right, likely to be rowdy. So I would like to, uh, you know, pre him well. Now this is maybe a challenge. Now in this kind of situation, I would like to do a delayed sequence intubation. Now this is something we don't use much, you know, and this is a very useful tool in our armamentarium. What you can do is give this patient a little ketamine. I'm not talking about induction doses, I'm talking about sleep doses. And you can give ketamine say 50 milligram to this patient and you can pre oxygenate them well start the high flow nasal cannula oxygen or the NIV while you're doing your other preparation with optimizing the hemodynamics etc even doing an awake fiber optic intubation in this patient won't be uh, you know easy unless you get some cooperation so my plan would be uh, you know doing an awake intubation by giving a bit of ketamine to this patient pre oxygenating him well using uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen Continuing the high flow nasal oxygen when I'm doing the, um, you know, the tracheal intubation using the awake flexible scope. And then once I've secured the airway, then I would like to, um, you know, then obviously give the muscle relaxant and the full induction dose. Uh, the reason I'm opting for this is because this is both a physiologically as well as an anatomically difficult airway. If the anatomical difficulty was not there, then I would optimize my pre oxygenation optimize my hemodynamics, resuscitate the patient, and then go forward towards intubation. And one more point about using apneic oxygenation that I want to emphasize is apneic oxygenation, you know, for it to work, you have to do three things. One is proper positioning of the patient, like I mentioned, you know, use proper position. The second most important thing that apneic oxygenation, it's not a rescue strategy. So when suddenly start, start, suddenly desaturating, you cannot just go and put a high flow nasal cannula oxygen, unlike what most people think. So you have to have adequately pre oxygenated the patient. Then only the apneic oxygenation will work. So good positioning and uh, you know adequate pre oxygenation. And the third very very important point for apneic oxygenation to work is that the airway should be patent. So this is very important because often after we give muscle relax in this tongue fall, the airway is obstructed. If the airway is obstructed, your apneic oxygenation will not work. So make sure you've given proper positioning, you've given adequate pre-oxygenation and you have a patent airway. And then your apneic oxygenation will give you a, you know, give you a lot of time in case you have uh, even an anatomical difficulty. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shira. I think that uh, you have summarized very well. So preparation of the patient is of paramount importance whenever you have a uh, a difficult airway, both anatomical or as well as physiological. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, both of you can answer. Have you done cricothyrotomy in uh, surgical cases? Any time in your <laughs> experience? Yeah. Uh, you you want to take that or can't intubate, can't ventilate, or uh, can't oxygenate? Yeah. So what we yeah. So I've done fortunately uh, cricothyrotomy only twice uh, in my career. I work at Tata Memorial Hospital, so we have a lot of head and neck cancer. We have a lot of challenging cases. Often when we do BLs, OPs, MLs, etc., we often lose, could lose the airway. And if you're in a situation where you have complete ventilated failure, so you have to always think 
that you have to transition transition from your upper airway techniques very quickly to neck rescue. And this is where we really, really fail. We go on and on and on trying for intubation. We go on and on trying, you know, we don't think supraglottic airway device. If the supraglottic airway device doesn't work more than two attempts, you have to think about emergency cryptotherapy. And we always think, oh, this is not going to happen today and this is not going to happen to us. And this is a technique that you've probably never done in your life. You've never practiced on a mannequin and it's really, really scary. So the uh, time I did this, uh, uh, the, my first case, I must tell you this experience, was a patient who was post commando for a redo surgery. And I had only, I was, my plan was an awake fibrotic intubation for this patient. And unfortunately, I can't show you the picture of this patient, but he was a difficult mask ventilation because of a previous a commando, you know, surgery was done. So I was obviously planned an awake fibrotic intubation and I had given him only one milligram of uh, midazolam. And this patient was very cathexic and he stopped breathing. And then I could not ventilate him. Of course, I couldn't intubate him. This, this was a difficult intubation, and that is why I had planned a weak fibrotic intubation. So this was my first, uh, you know, cryotherapy. So I did a needle cryotherapy, and for, we have jet ventilation. And remember, in needle cryotherapy, it's not about just putting a needle in. Anesthetists are very uh, good at this technique. We're familiar with Seldinger. We can even use these kind of tools. But remember, when you do a needle cryotherapy, you need uh, a jet, jet ventilation. Ventilate. So if you don't have jet ventilation, it's not about putting a needle in, then the scalpel bougie technique becomes the best strategy. The other set that I've used is I use the uh, cook uh, you know, set. Uh, yeah, there's a Seldinger technique. And, and both the techniques, um, I was successful. What I'm trying to say is the best cryotherapy is the one that you don't perform. So the first thing is try to avoid you know, proceeding to this uh, situation. And very often you can avoid the situation with proper planning and second is anticipate and recognize that this has happened. If you recognize this early, then you can really save the day by transitioning and moving into whatever technique you're familiar with. It is not necessary that you should use only surgical or scalpel tools, your needle. Be familiar with one technique. Talk, you know, plan it with your team, practice it on a mannequin and whenever you have this situation, make sure you transition from upper airway techniques to neck rescue very quickly. So that is what I'd like to say about my experience here. Yeah. Dr. Apex, would you like to share your experience on emergency cryotherapy? If you a lot of emergency, not emergency cryotherapy and cadaver, uh -huh. but in uh, in real sense, in I didn't and I didn't get the uh, opportunity to do it. But important thing is not just performing the cryotherapy. Important thing is when to do cryotherapy is very important. See, uh, people are most of the people are following or telling that when you can't intubate, when you can't oxygen go for emergency cryotherapy. So, what do you mean by can't oxygenate? Means so where, where you should, what should be the trigger point for cryotherapy? That is very important. If you are if you are waiting for situation to fall down and then you are taking the knife in your hand and perform cryotherapy, you will not get proper success. So, timing is very important and uh, if you are following the, just the CICO, what is CO? Cannot oxygen. What do you mean by it? When situation fall down to 90? Suppose patient is maintaining the saturation as uh, 88 and not falling down. Will you take the uh, knife in your hand? Or at what saturation, when saturation goes to 70, you will take the uh, knife in your hand? Or, uh, or saturation is going down to 40, at that time you are going to take the knife? So this is not clearly defined if you are just following CICO. So, so there should be a clear cut uh, trigger point for emergency cricotherotomy. And if you follow this, if you severe, complete ventilator failure, means if you are not able to ventilate the patient by any means, not able to ventilate by uh, endotical tube, not able to ventilate by the mask, or not able to ventilate by the supraglottic airway devices, or face mask, th that is the time you should hold the knife in your hand and go for emergency cryotherotomy, whether saturation is normal or not. That is very important, rather than just performing the cryotherotomy. I, I just, if I can just add on a point, I think Apeksha has made a very, very important point. You know, I did this, uh, uh, um, you know, we did a survey to find out what was the trigger. And we were amazed that people said that they should perform emergency cryotherapy when the saturation starts to fall. Remember, there's a lot of human factor involved at that time. You're already very tense. You're not able to intubate, not able to ventilate this patient, not able to put cryotherapy. This is a very stressful situation in which a procedure like emergency cryotherapy that you've never done in your life, like Dr. Apeksha says, or you've never practiced or you don't know which technique is not going to work. Your hands are shaking, trembling. So you shouldn't be doing when the saturation falls. Remember ventilation failure, 
precedes oxygenation failure. So if you go for cannot oxygenate, you know, it will be too late. So the moment you see that the patient cannot be ventilated by whatever means, like he said, even if the saturation is 100%, you know that this patient is going to be saturated. Another very important point is today we are in the era where we are giving ethnic oxygenation. We are using Thrive. You can maintain the saturation at 100 for a long time. So you cannot, the moment you cannot ventilate this patient, you know that, uh, you know, desaturation is inevitable at some point. So in the era of ethnic oxygenation, this cannot oxygenation terminology becomes even more leading and this misleading. And that is the reason why now the universal guidelines, which I'm a part of, they have abandoned cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate and are focusing on cannot ventilate because this ventilation failure, uh, you know, precedes oxygenation failure. And the reason Apex and I are emphasizing this is because the trigger should be when you can't ventilate. Whether your saturation is high or low, even if it is 100, you should start doing an emergency cryotherapy at this point. Yeah, as you rightly said, Dr. Sheila, we are maintaining that apneic oxygenation because of the recent advances, even up to 100 minutes, but at the expense of decreased, um, you know, acidosis, uh, increased uh, CO2 retention and decreased pH. So, as you rightly said, I think, you know, we need to act on time before the patient starts deoxygenating, uh, desaturating and then, you know, secure the airway the best way possible in the best safety uh, standards. Any other questions, Dr. No questions. Sunil? I think most of them... Uh, repeat questions that so they already have been the answered. same thing i yeah. think they almost covered uh, so thank you so much dr apesh and dr sheila for sharing thank your you. uh, no valuable knowledge and experiences and also evidence based um, you know it helps us a lot for the audiences and also the anesthesiologist to keep us updated about the recent information and also the best balanced and safety techniques of airway management before it goes out of our hand thank you thank you so much both of you for uh, you know spending your valuable time with us and showing some light on these uh, difficult and uh, both anatomically and also physiologically Simpl difficult, difficult airways. airways. <laughs> you have simplified the myth of difficult airway. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Dr. Pandey and Dr. Lakshmi. And yeah, I just take thank this opportunity so to thank uh, AIG Hospital and uh, uh, Director of Surgical Gastroenterology Minimal Invasive Surgery Dr. Jeevira for giving us this platform to share uh, this webinar and also thank our audiovisual team for making all the arrangements. And uh, we'll catch you up again very soon if uh, <laughs> in future. Thank you very much uh, for giving your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you.